Let's start with a polynomial f of x, where all the coefficients are integers, and the highest degree term has coefficient 1. This is what we call a monic polynomial. Now here's what makes this interesting. We know that when we plug in four different integers, let's call them a, b, c, and d, our polynomial spits out the value 5 every single time. The question we want to answer is this. Could there be some other integer k where this polynomial equals 8? Before jumping into the algebraic machinery, I always like to build some visual intuition for what's really happening here. Picture a coordinate plane. We don't know exactly what our polynomial f of x looks like as a curve, but we do know some crucial constraints. Let me start by drawing a horizontal line at height 5. What we know is that our polynomial curve crosses this horizontal line at exactly four integer x coordinates. These crossing points are what we're calling a, b, c, and d. Now I'll add another horizontal line, this time at height 8. The big question is whether our polynomial curve could also intersect this higher line at some integer x coordinate. If such a point exists, we'd call that x value k. At first glance, this might seem totally reasonable. But here's the thing, the fact that we're dealing with integers everywhere turns out to impose incredibly rigid constraints. Let's see why. The key insight here is to change our perspective slightly. Instead of working directly with f of x, let's define a closely related polynomial that will make the structure clearer. Looking at our constraints, notice that the value 5 keeps showing up. When x equals a, f equals 5. When x equals b, f equals 5. And so on. This repeated appearance of 5 suggests something elegant we can do. What if we simply subtract 5 from our polynomial? Let's see what that gives us. So we define this new polynomial g of x to be f of x minus 5. Now, something beautiful happens. At all four of our special x values, g evaluates to 0. Let me write this out clearly. We are defining g of x to be f of x minus 5. What this means is that a, b, c, and d are now roots of g, places where the polynomial equals 0. Now, having roots is incredibly useful because it tells us about the factors of our polynomial. We just established that g of x has roots at a, b, c, and d. There's a fundamental theorem that says, whenever a polynomial has a root at some value, say a, then x minus a must divide that polynomial. Since we have four distinct roots, we can factor out four linear terms. This means g of x equals the product of x minus a times x minus b times x minus c times x minus d, all multiplied by some remaining polynomial h of x. Now you might wonder, what can we say about this leftover piece h of x? Well, since our original f was monic with integer coefficients, so is g. And that product of linear factors also has integer coefficients. By a classical result in algebra, this forces h to have integer coefficients too. The key takeaway is this. Whenever we plug an integer into h, we are guaranteed to get an integer back out. You might be thinking, wait a minute. Why couldn't it have, say, fractional coefficients that somehow still give integer outputs for integer inputs? This is where some deeper algebra comes in. There's a classical result related to something called Gauss's content lemma that says when you divide one monic integer polynomial by another, the quotient must also have integer coefficients. So h really does have to be an integer polynomial. All right, we've built up all the machinery we need. Now let's see how this leads to a contradiction. Let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that there really is some integer k where f of k equals 8. Remember how we defined g? It's f of k minus 5. So if f of k equals 8, then g of k equals 8 minus 5. Using our definition of g, we can rewrite the left side. So we have g of k equals 8 minus 5. And 8 minus 5 is just 3. So we get g of k equals 3. But remember how we factored g? We can substitute that factored form here. This gives us a really interesting equation. We have k minus a times k minus b times k minus c times k minus d times h of k, all equal to 3. Now let's think about what we have here. Since k and all of a, b, c, d are integers, each of these differences is an integer. 
and we establish that h of k is also an integer. Crucially, since a, b, c, and d are all different from each other, these four factors k minus a through k minus d are four distinct integers. Here's where the integer constraints are about to box us into a corner. We have five integers multiplied together, and their product is three. Now, if integers multiply to give three, what does that tell us about each individual integer? They must all be divisors of three. So what are the divisors of three? The only possibilities are one, negative one, three, and negative three. Here's the crucial observation. There are exactly four distinct divisors, and we need exactly four distinct factors. So these factors must be precisely these four divisors in some order. In other words, the set of our four factors equals the set of all divisors of three. Now let's compute what happens when we multiply all four of these divisors together. We get one times negative, one times three times negative three, and this equals nine. But wait, let's go back to our original equation. We now know that product equals nine. So our equation becomes nine times h of k equals three, dividing both sides by nine to solve for h of k. We get h of k equals three ninths, which simplifies to one third. So h of k equals one third. But this is impossible. Remember, we proved that h of k has to be an integer whenever k is an integer, but one third is definitely not an integer. So let's step back and see what we've shown. We assumed there was some integer k where f of k equals 8, and that assumption led us to conclude that an integer equals one-third, which is absurd. Therefore, we have definitively proven that there is no integer k such that f of k equals 8. The contradiction forced by integer constraints makes this impossible. If you enjoyed this mathematical journey through polynomial constraints and elegant contradictions, I'd really appreciate it if you could give this video a like. And if you're curious about more mathematical explorations like this one, consider subscribing for more videos where we dive deep into the beautiful structures hiding in mathematics.